Hello, it's uh, John Robb here. It's been uh, Richard Strange. I'm quite fascinated, Richard. Uh, I know quite, quite a lot about the records you put out, of course, but I can never work out where you actually came from. I know you're from London. And yeah. I just, what, what were your roots? Well, it was funny. I mean, my house, I, yeah, I grew up in, in, in South London. I'm a, a product of a sort of lower middle class family. My dad was uh, a lunatic, but he was also a statistician. But we mistrusted the arts and anything foreign in our house to the point of paranoia. You know, we, uh, we had a radio and a TV, but the idea that anyone would go to a concert or go to a gallery was just like, you know, you're kidding me. Yeah. Um, and like so many people I know in so many different uh, uh, fields of uh, endeavor, you go back to a teacher somewhere back in, you know, and I went to a big South London comprehensive school called Tulse Hill School. Um, and I had two older brothers. My eldest brother, John, grew up in the 50s, so he sort of brought rock and roll into the house. Elvis Presley, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, that sort of stuff. And my, my middle brother, Brian, was closer to my age, and we grew up in the 60s, not the 50s. So we grew up with the Beatles and the Stones and the Animals and the, the Who and uh, the Small Faces, the Yardbirds, pretty things. They were our bands. But then one day my brother brought home a record by this weird looking American guy called Bob Dylan, right? And he put it on and my mind was blown. I'd never heard anything like it. I was 13, 14. I'd always loved words, uh, but you didn't go to pop music to find words ever. You went to books, you know, and then suddenly there's this poet uh, singing like uh, the lonesome death of Hattie Carroll and this idea of protest music, which was just chiming with the me that was emerging. And I took this record into school one day and it had poems on the back of the album cover. And my English teacher had a look at it. So, Blimey, what's this? This is pop or what? I said, well, it's uh, American protest music. He looked at it, he said, if you like this stuff, you might like Allen Ginsberg. You might like William Burroughs. You might like Jack Kerouac. You might like Dylan Thomas. You might even like Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> suddenly, he was giving me books to read, you know, that I'd never heard of, you know. And of course, some of them went right over my head as a 14, 15 year old. But some of them I really got, Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac. William Burroughs, I really got. And you couldn't buy William Burroughs in this country because he was reckoned to be both obscene and blasphemous. Not a bad combination. <laughs> <laughs> when you're 15, what more do you want from a writer? You know? <laughs> but me and my mate Joe, Joe Gilbert, we were interested in all this beat writing. And we were also, I mean, rather tragically for 15 year olds, we were interested in contemporary art where other guys were going out and meeting girls and getting drunk or, I don't know, going to football matches or something. We were going to galleries. We were bunking off school to go to galleries, you know. And well, seeing... where, did, where did that interest come from? Was that just uh, another I thing, think, another I, teacher I, or...? Yeah, I think what it was, again, was this, this idea of the bohemian world that was hinted at by the beat writers. Uh, so you had the literature, but you also had hints of jazz and you had instrument, uh, hints of abstract art and pop art, you know, coming along in the early 60s. Um, you know, I read about this guy who was writing, who was uh, painting uh, Campbell soup cans. I didn't even need to see his paintings. I could see him in my head and I thought, that's so cool. You know, not doing sunsets or portraits of dukes or duchesses or popes or, but doing stuff that I could see in the high street every day, uh, but doing them in beautiful colors. And Andy Warhol, he wore shades indoors. I mean, so cool. And then, of course, when 1967 came along and we were listening to The Doors and The Beatles and The Stones and the psychedelic stuff, and we heard that Andy Warhol had a band that he was producing called The Velvet Underground, which sounded like the name of a, a William Burroughs book anyway, so already I'm halfway there. Saw a photo of them, all wearing shades and leather jackets indoors. Uh, you know, and listen to that first album and I was gone, you know. That and Bob Dylan, I suppose, are my two big early influences from the 60s. So where could, where could you go to share this passion? Was, was there anywhere around Tulsa or did you have to go um, to town? I had a couple of mates at school who, who got it as well. And we were like, 
are you sure about that? You know, because the other music that was coming through then was a lot of Tamla Motown, a lot of James Brown and soul music. Otis Redding was all, 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 all the rage then, Rufus Thomas, um, uh, Aretha Franklin, and, and um, you know, all that stack stuff was coming through. Um, but this experimental music that was happening both here with Yardbirds referencing Gregorian chants or using feedback and the Beatles referencing Eastern and Indian stuff and the Stones just being the Stones, you know. The first gig I ever went to was to see the Kinks uh, at uh, the Streatham Ice Rink when they were just number one with You Really Got Me. And mm. What a start. Uh, I know. I mean, they, they just got to number one. So that must be 1963, I guess, 64. I was 12, 13. And the support band, uh, whatever happened to them, James Fender and the Vulcans, um, <laughs> <laughs> invited us along because they lived in the next street and we were sort wow. of mates. Yeah. Walked in and Kings, they probably only had three AC30 amplifiers, but turned up to maximum in, uh, in an ice rink the sound was like a weapon, right? Mm. And I was just gone, man. I was just sold on it. I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. That excitement, that uh, uh, the rebelliousness of it, you know, it's, the, it, it's probably the first heavy metal concert, the truth be told, you know. Was there, so, a, a, was there a theatricality to all this as well, which appealed to you? Well, the, the kinks used to wear sort of hunting jackets, you know, and... Uh, the hair was the theatricality at that time. Mm. The longer the hair, the more it upset your parents. And the more <laughs> rock and roll upsets your parents, the more it's doing its job. You know, yeah. That's why, uh, God bless her, Adele is not a rock star because your parents like her. It's yeah. so wrong. You know, Phil Oakey is a rock star. You know, Johnny Rotten <laughs> is a rock star. Uh, Brian Jones and the Pretty Things and, you know, John Lennon and all those people, they're rock stars. Bob Dylan, you know, uh, doing those interviews when he was just so impenetrably oblique and, and difficult. That's a rock star. Lou Reed doing an interview. That's mm. rock and roll. <laughs> I mean, and, and could you, art were you trying to articulate this in any way at all? What, you know, initially, would it yeah, be painted or? Well, for me, it was, it was a bit of painting, but it was tortured poetry, mm. you know, tortured adolescent poetry with uh, quite a strong protest edge, you know, but even back then I was very much on the left uh, and, 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 and uh, I was outraged by social injustice, by the fact that you still had segregation in the States, you still had apartheid in South Africa, uh, that, you know, people were marching in Paris in 1968, I was 17 and I was up for that, you know, going to um, Grosvenor Square uh, uh, for the anti-Vietnam uh, demonstrations. You name it, I was on it back then, you know, mm. much to my parents' horror, you know. <laughs> uh, but Vietnam in a way, and, and apartheid were two great unifying factors. Now, what you had was a, a left that was so um, splintered between Trotskyists and Leninists and Stalinists and Maoists and all that, you know. But these were the great unifying issues of the day, if you were even vaguely interested in politics, the issues were the Vietnam War and, and uh, I suppose the larger picture of colonialism and post-colonialism and you know the, the loss of empire and uh, civil rights. And then obviously our generation likes to think we invented women's rights, gay rights, civil rights, environmentalism. <laughs> and to an extent, the 60s were the breeding ground of a lot of those things. Um, but we didn't achieve everything uh, and uh, there's a lot that we did achieve a lot that we didn't abortion became legal good uh, civil rights became legal uh, the, the racial discrimination uh, racial, racial equality act was brought in homosexuality was 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 legalized in 1967 so these are all steps forward I think right now of course we feel that so many of these gains and advantages and uh, little bits of progress that were made over 30 years, 40, 50 years ago, are slowly being clawed back. And you feel that, especially in America, you know, where you think 
They just wish it was 1950 again. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just give us a Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're working that with China, aren't yeah. they? So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know, it's, it's almost as if, well, we know history, history is swings and pendulums and, and all that, but it's almost as if this whole uh, schism uh, in Britain at the moment, you know, where we are really polarised, right, almost down the middle, 48%, 52%, about people who want to live in the 21st century and people who really miss 1950, mm. you know. Uh, and this idea of little England and this clinging on to some sort of empire that is so long gone and, you know, just get over it. We were, we were lucky to be built, born white English speaking Europeans in the sixties. I know that that was a privilege. That is all you wanted to be living in London, being white male in the 1960s. You know, that was like being touched with the lucky stick. Mm. But, mm. you know, the same was probably true in 500 BC, if you were Egyptian, you know, yeah. you were top of the yeah. tree. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it doesn't last forever, you know, no one, uh, you don't hear the Greeks now, you know, saying, oh, we've got to have empire, we've got to get Persia back. <laughs> <laughs> There will be a few, but well, not, right, half, yeah. not half the country. So, <laughs> so what point did you start to try to articulate this into music? Um, I suppose what happened, I said my father was insane. He was literally insane. He was the first person in this country to have a, um, a lobotomy. But he was also an incredibly, uh, he, he was conventional to the point of insanity. Uh, so he could not brook any sort of sense of rebellion, of protest, of dissent. Uh, and so when I uh, finished school, 1969, I was 18 and I'd got three A-levels and I was gonna be the first person in my family ever to go to university. I got off the place in Norwich um, to do Scandinavian studies. Why Scandinavian studies? Because I just met a beautiful Danish girl, right? And, <laughs> and, 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 and part of the deal with Scandinavian studies was you got to spend a year in a, a Scandinavian country. Easily distracted then, yeah. Easily <laughs> distracted, yeah. So these are maybe not the most noble reasons to pursue your <laughs> academic career, but there you go. So uh, I, I, I announced to him that I was going to university. He said, you're not. I said, he, he said, no one in our family's ever been to university. You go out and get a job. I thought, mm. so my brother and I got onto my brother's Lambretta motor scooter. But it was summer holiday. I wasn't going to go to university in September. So we just thought, let's just go on an adventure. We drove to um, Copenhagen anyway. Uh, he stayed there. He met a girl and never came back. Um, and I bought a guitar there. Uh, I thought that's really going to get up my dad's nose even more than going to university. You know, I say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm training for a job, dad. You know, <laughs> uh, and uh, that was the start of it. And so for the next three, four years, they're agonizing, learning the chords, you know, and uh, boring anyone or listen with your attempt at a song. Uh, and it's all very derivative. But at that time, I was totally hooked on the English sort of folk scene, but the folk scene in England was not anymore. It wasn't finger in your ear. It was Roy Harper, Al Stewart, Bert Yanch, John Martin, Sandy Denny, uh, Richard Thompson, Nick Drake. It was those sort of singer songwriters, uh, pretty much acoustic artists. And I would go to um, the folk clubs in London. One was called Bunches and one was called uh, Les Cousins. And see these people Every week, Roy Harper and uh, Bert Yanch were probably my two favourites. And I got to know Roy pretty well, he even uh, came and lived with me for a while. Um, and, and for a long time, I put everything I wrote up to the Roy Harper test. What would Roy think of this? You know, like, because he was such a hero to me and because he was such a cantankerous old bastard, you know, he, he didn't give a damn about anything. And, uh, you know, he would write a 45 minute long protest rant called I, uh, you know, or a song called I Hate the White Man, or, yeah. you know, I just thought, that's, yes, that's all I want to do is that sort of stuff. So that was my way into music. But then gradually I thought, I'm not good enough really as a singer or, not, or a guitarist. I need a, a good racket behind me. So I'm thinking about the Velvet Underground and that very abrasive, 
uh, avant-garde sort of uh, um, wall of noise with feedback and just, just with sheer two fingers up to up, uh, up to the world. And I sort of put those two things together. So it was lyrics and then getting people behind me who, who would share in this dream of making a, a godforsaken racket behind me when I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I sang these songs. And so 1973-74, uh, we finally got what became Doctors of Madness, which was myself, Peter Dilemma, who'd been at school with me, so I knew him from school, the drummer, Stoner, who was living down the road, and I'd known him for a while, bass player, and Urban Blitz, the violin player, who we we found in the time-honoured fashion of the... the um, small ads at the back of the melody maker back then mm. you know it's, inter uh, it's interesting so the the way you created music was dictated by what your perceived limitations you know you absolutely you perceived you were a natural singer or a natural guitar player but still, you, but, uh, you know even, a communicator even, yeah, in a sense. yeah yeah exactly that i mean even to this day I'm, I'm probably more mindful now than ever of my limitations and uh i'm probably much more um, uh, amenable now to collaborations, just because I'm 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 very, um, as I say, very mindful of what I can do and what I can't do, what my strengths are, and what my weaknesses are, and rather than try and do everything, um, get people who can do stuff better than, than me to 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 work on stuff, and that goes across the board. That's musicians and producers and engineers and and, and sound guys. Uh, but also graphic designers and filmmakers and, and uh, uh, yeah, collaborators generally. And I do a lot of teaching now to master's students, um, uh, creativity and uh, contemporary music. And that's one of the first pieces of advice I ever give them is work with other people, especially people who can do it better than you, because that's mm. the way you learn. You know, if you're, even if you're a, a guitarist and a singer, work with another guitarist if that's the extent of your horizons, but just work with someone who's better than you. Otherwise, you'll never learn anything. So what do you see your role as? You know, um, obviously you, in the band, you were the singer, but do you see yeah. it more as a communicator, an instigator? Communicator. I was, I've always had uh, uh, quite extraordinary energy, self-belief, confidence, uh, and also a bloody mindedness that just uh, has always enabled me to solve problems in some way. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very practical person, if not uh, a conventionally practical person. I'm very pragmatic, if you like. So when the doctors started, uh, we had that old catch-22. How do you get gigs when no one knows you? And how do you get people to know you when you're not doing any gigs? And so I found this pub in uh, Twickenham, which was uh, where my girlfriend at the time was studying art, and went there on a Sunday night or a Saturday night, I think it was. And they had a music room upstairs, but no one was playing. And there were two people in there, you know, and it's a godforsaken place. And I said to the landlord, do you have music here anymore? And he said, well, we've tried it and, it, you know, no one seems to come. I said, could I do a month of Saturdays here? Uh, with my band and you know you got two people in I promise you you'll have two, more than two people in when we play so you know you, you can't lose so he said all right well we'll give it a try so in those days obviously no social media no no internet no email so everything was hard copies posters flyers maybe a little ad in timeout if we could afford it or in uh, Melody Maker word of mouth obviously phone calls to friends and stuff anyway we we got in, in in there on that first Saturday and about 20 people came and the landlord was happy and we were sort of okay. Next week, maybe 40 people came. Next week, maybe 80 people came. And the following week, we just about sold it out, 120 people or whatever. The landlord was thrilled to bits, you know, because they were all drinking his beer. And, um, uh, and we were great that night. With It was almost like the the culmination of all this frustration of not really having any gear, not having transport, not having a manager, not having a record company. And this was our last gig. And then it was like, now what? Doesn't matter, you play to 120 people, you're back at square one again next week because you haven't got a gig. 
<laughs> so anyway, we did that, and we were we were we were on fire that night, and um, so we were in the dr- little call it a dressing room, is a broom, broom cupboard afterwards, you know, having a beer and knock on the door, and uh, a guy comes in and says. Um, are you guys professional or semi-professional? I said, was semi-professional, we've got to turn professional. He said, I manage a band called Genesis. I hate Genesis, right? And his name is Jonathan King. And I hate Jonathan King even more, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking, uh-uh, no thanks. Uh, so, you know, we sort of show him the door and the band says to me, have you fucking lost your mind? That was our one chance of turning professional. He <laughs> manages Genesis. I said, hey, Genesis, it's just wrong, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, he goes out. Uh, five minutes later, there's another knock on the door and a sort of cigar comes in about two minutes before the bloke smoking it. It's so long, right? And it is your classic East End wide boy rock and roll manager coming in called Brian Morrison. Brian Morrison had published Pink Floyd and T-Rex. He'd managed the pretty things. He'd made so much money by the time he was 30, he'd retired. He'd got his own polo club. It was like Spinal Tap, but now he was bored. And someone who'd come last week said to him, Brian, if you want to get back into the music business, if you're missing it, go and see this band. They're a bit different. It's okay, man, he said, yeah, you kids have got a lot to learn, you know, he's like, <laughs> but, you know, you got something, I'll give you that. If you're serious about turning pro, come into my office and sign a contract on Monday. It was like the dream, you know, that is the <laughs> dream, isn't it, in rock and roll. Um, so we went up there, as in Mayfair, and he got out of the champagne, and there's the gold discs on the wall, Pink Floyd, T-Rex, and the Bee Gees he, he published as well at that time. And it was flash, and he was crooked, and he was... Uh, totally plausible. And he said, sign here, <laughs> sign here, sign here, sign here. We signed everything. I think I signed away 170% of anything I could ever run while I was with him. <laughs> and I'm still paying for it even now. But what, what, what was his vision of the band? Because even right, at that well, point, I, I imagine, you, I mean, you never fitted it anywhere, really. No, we didn't. And that's what he loved. Brian Morrison always had a great instinct. So... A Brian Morrison story. Someone said to him when he he studied at um, Central School of uh, Art in London. Every lunchtime, he'd go up and down um, Charing Cross Road, looking in the old uh, second-hand record and bookshops. Uh, the Beatles and the Stones had just started up, and there was a band at his art school called the Pretty Things, which um, uh, would like the Stones, but even dirtier, even more uh, unmarketable, if you like. Mm. Uh, And he started managing them. And someone said to him, Brian, management is the arse end of the business. Get into music publishing. All these bands are now starting to write their own music for the first time. You know, before it had been Tim Pan Alley had been writing the music and the Beatles sort of kicked the doors down and started writing their own music. Then the Stones did and so did everyone else and his uncle. So Brian set himself up as a music publisher. And he's walking down King, uh, Charing Cross Road one day and he finds uh, a seven inch final copy of the Chinese national anthem. And he looks on both sides and no one publishes it in the UK, right? He says mm. it's the Chinese national anthem. So he, he bought this for sixpence or whatever, got his mate who was a musicologist to transcribe it into, into music registered it as his um, uh, copyright. And it was the year of the Olympic Games that year, right? So every time China won a medal, <laughs> got, up, got up on the podium, uh, on British TV, he would ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching on performing uh, PRS for, for rights. So that was the sort of guy Brian was. He was <laughs> so yeah, he, was, he worked with uh, Pink Floyd. He worked with uh, T-Rex. He worked with Bee Gees. He had an agency as well as a management company and a publishing company. And so he signed us to his agency, his management and his publishing company. Uh, but he just saw something in us like subsequently uh, go forward about six years. And he brought me a cassette. Uh, I was still with him at that time. He brought me a cassette. He said, what do you think of this, my son? And he always called me my son. 
uh, and he played it. I mean, it's the most appalling white boy rap music. He said, they want 150 quid advance. I'm gonna beat them down to 100. But I think they've got something. I said, Brian, save your money. He didn't listen to me and it was wham, right? Oh, yeah, 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 it was yeah, wham yeah. rap, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. And so in his, in his best year, he, 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 he earned 60 million quid with George Michael on Careless Whisper alone. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you've got to say, he, he, despite all the, uh, the sort of the white boyness of him, he's, yeah. he's totally got the, uh, he had it took the ears. Yeah. He, had it yeah. Is. he had the cure. He had uh, Paul Weller, the jam. Mm. Um, you know, he didn't always get it right. <laughs> 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 because he signed the Dr. Madness, you know. But he had a really good strike rate. Well, Wait, well, so, so go back to doctors. I mean, did, yeah. did he have a vision for you? I mean, was he yeah, one of those he, who... what, he, what he did was he just said, I don't want to get in the way of what you're doing because you're you've obviously got in your own heads what you're like. Because we were quite flamboyant, you know, I had blue hair, we were wearing sort of street clothes, we weren't dressing for the stage, we were street clothes. We'd already taken on these names, Kid Strange, Urban Blitz, Peter Dilemma, Stoner. He said, all I'm going to do is put you in a rehearsal studio for six weeks to sort out your material, your, your stage show and your identity, if you like, who you are. And then we'll do some photos and we'll get some record companies. So that's what he did. Um, and at the end of that six weeks, we were pretty good. We had a few lights in that studio and we had you know, smoke machine and stuff. And then he'd get the real big wigs of pop music to come along, like Ahmet Ertegun and Clive Davis, you know, for, for you know, real giants of the industry, because Brian was so respected. Mm. Um, they would come. If he said, I've got a band, they would come. And he, he would say to us, you give them three fucking songs and that's it. And don't talk to them. I'll do the talking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and his partner was a guy called Justin de Villeneuve who managed mm -hmm. Twiggy, yeah? So the two of them were our managers then from uh, 1975. And they got us a record deal with Polydor. And then our first tour was, was out supporting Bebop Deluxe, a band called Bebop Deluxe, Bill Nelson's band. And we went out and did all the big uh, concert halls in Britain. You know, we did the Free Trade Hall. We did Leeds University. We did a big London gig, Albert Hall or somewhere. Um, Bristol Colston, Glasgow Empire, you know, all the big gigs around. Uh, Good tour as well. I mean, that's pr probably of all the bands at that time. That's one you're almost the closest to. I almost thought. closest to. Yeah. And also EMI had big hopes for them. So they were, this was their big tour. Um, and so we sort of learned the ropes really of how you do it on stage, obviously we'd seen Bowie and Roxy Music and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, Bill Nelson and, 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 and Bebop, they were about as close to us as you could get in as much as they were an art school band. Bill was an art school kid. He read books and saw films, you know, did, did what? <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, Bill and I got on really well and he loved Jean Cocteau and I loved Cocteau and he got Burroughs, I got Burroughs. And he's just a kind, gentle, decent man as well. So there's none of this like treat the um, treat the support band like shit, you know. So mm. we, 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 we had a good time and we picked up a lot of fans. And as you say, people who were going to see Bebop were maybe more predisposed towards us than uh, people going to see Status Quo or going to see ACDC or something, you know, because um, there was a theatricality and there was a uh, our, our, our reference pool, if you like, for the songwriting material was probably much, much the same. I wouldn't be surprised if Bill's record collection and mine were pretty similar at that time. It'd be Bowie and Roxy Music and some Dylan and some Beatles and stuff, and then some sort of avant-garde, rather esoteric stuff on the side, bit of jazz, bit of spoken word stuff, bit of art school rock, you know, and, and Velvet Underground, and that would be it, yeah. In, in many ways, I mean, you had everything right, you know. I mean, you see, I mean, you just mentioned Roxy and Bowie, and yeah. they're, they're, their audience, surely that will be the audience you should have ended up with. I mean, it's yeah. you've got theatricality, it's kind of glam, but not glam. It's it's kind of the way that Roxy are as well. It's kind yeah. of, yeah. you know, Roxy are kind of prog, but not prog, but they're kind exactly. of pop, not pop. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a space for you. So how come you never ended up occupying? Well, I mean, you did, you did well, but not as well. We, we did okay. I tell you. 
in a way, there's some there's some things that you cannot uh, predict or anticipate. So we're going out. We've made our first album. The album gets mixed reviews because it's not easy to put into a, a, a bag. It's it's not even Mott the Hoople, you know. It's it's you know there's some obvious references, Velvets and and uh, Bowie, you know, in it. But it's not that either. It's not it's not the full on Bowie experience. It's not the full on Velvet Underground experience talking about, uh, um, uh, I don't know, working at Andy's factory or something like that. So it's a little bit, we're a little bit cut adrift. Also, I've got sequins on my eyes. I've got blue hair. No one's got this stuff at that time. You know, you got, you got, Bowie had the hennaed hair, but it's almost like a natural color when Bowie goes orange, you know, it's like, oh look, he's a redhead. When you got blue hair, you know, it's, it's it's a bit of a statement, you know, and your blue hair and your kid's strange. Now, not everyone's going to like that at a time when prog rock is still pretty much the only other thing in town. You've got prog rock, you've got pub rock, right? Mm. So you've got the Dr. Feelgoods, the Kilburn and the High Roads, the uh, Ducks Deluxe, you've got uh, uh, Brinsley Schwartz, all those bands, which we certainly were. They were much better players than I ever wanted to be. So we're sort of in a field of one when we're doing it. Anyway, uh, we're getting okay reviews, to, both live and, and, and for the album. The first album's come out. Uh, but we're really polarising the critics as well as the audiences, you know, and it's not easy to get our music on the radio either at that time because you've got John Peel, uh, who didn't much care for us. He thought we were all right, but we were never a favourite like the undertones for us or the fall or something. So, you know, it was a slightly lonely existence. We did quite a lot of uh, European work. Uh, and we're getting 600, 800 people a night to come and see us wherever we play. We're doing the student unions uh, and, the, and the big clubs, you know, the, um, around. So uh, in our own right, rather than as a support band. So one day I get a call from my agent, Martin Hopewell. He said, um, look, you've got this gig coming up in Middlesbrough. Do me a favor. You're the only guy I could ask for this because no one else would get it. I'm being driven mad by a manager in London who's got this band, mm. got a bit of a dodgy reputation, right? <laughs> uh, but he wants them to play outside London. Can they play with you in Middlesbrough? It was the Sex Pistols, it was Malcolm, right? I said, yeah, I've read a bit about them. They, they reminded me of, uh, of us a bit. You know, they were sort of outcasts. They were three, four, five years younger than us. And that's a whole generation in music, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought, what could possibly go wrong? You know, so uh, they came up to Middlesbrough. We doing our sound check there. They're being really obnoxious. And then they went on and did their sound check. And I thought, oh, God, God awful racket. Um, <laughs> And then more or less, as soon as they came off, the doors opened and then it was time for them to go on again. And these kids came down and you know, they were a Docs of the Madness uh, crowd, but some of them were wearing sort of torn t-shirts and had punky spiked up hair and stuff like that. And it was obvious that they'd read a bit about the Sex Pistols um, as I had in, in, in the music press. And they'd only done the one gig at St. Martin's Art School at that point. Um, so I thought, I'm gonna have all, I'll, I'll watch them from the wings. And I watched it, I thought, it's over for me. I just thought it's over. The wind has changed direction. Mm. You know, they did two, uh, a, they did a 20 minute set of two minute songs, each of which had two chords. And the attitude was all, ah, you know, and it was <laughs> like, there was no, um, there was no pretense of ever having read a book or ever seen a film. It was just all about that attitude of anger or of boredom or of both, right? Mm. Which because, you know, and I thought, that's it. I'm supposed to be doing two more albums for Polydor. And I'm supposed to, you know, and I thought I'd be, you know, 40 years down the line, I thought I'd be on Moustique with Princess Margaret <laughs> and Mick Jagger, you know. But uh, I can see that that's changed. Um, but we did, that, we did. Hmm? But the irony of that is that, that really you were kind of an influence or, or the, so many big of those bands coming through. Big yeah. influence on those, there's so many of those bands coming through. That's a funny thing. I mean, I was 
best man at Dave Anian's wedding from the dam. Dave joined us on stage whenever he could. Tim, TV Smith from the adverts joined us on stage. In Scotland, when we played, the Skids supported us, Simple Minds supported us. In Manchester, a band called Warsaw, who changed their name to Joy Division, supported us, you know. Uh, mm. in on the northeast penetration would would support us you know it was all those bands who um they were doctors of madness fans but doctors of madness weren't punk rock in the same way that john the baptist wasn't jesus christ mm. i think you know it, it uh, i think we came to bear witness to the light but we were not the light you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, to give it a biblical spin but you know as i say the doctors sang about uh, urban decay, about dystopian societies, about government uh, uh, surveillance and paranoia and, uh, and obviously drugs and, 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 and living on the street and all that sort of stuff, which became the stock in trade of, of, of punk rock as a, a subject matter. With the exception of this song, Waiting, which I wrote in 1975, which was arguably the first British punk song, you know, go one, two, three, four, da, na, 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 you know, um, and which, you know, to this day, people say, you know, that was the, 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 the most exciting thing I'd ever heard. We, we weren't punk rock, but we ticked every box. So it was a weird thing because we hadn't called ourselves punk rock and then something came along that was called punk rock. But there again, you know, you think, were the police punk rock? Were the stranglers punk rock? Mm. What was what was punk rock anyway? You think, punk rock, you think the Pistols, the Clash, Susie and the Banshees, the Buzzcocks, uh, and then the, the the rest of the bands that we've all forgotten, Slaughter and the Dogs, Eater, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Subway Sect, you know, all these, I'm not saying that disparagingly, but that was the stuff that was in Sniffing Glue at the time. It was those bands, with Chelsea, you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so to that extent, I'm really glad I wasn't a punk rock band because I would probably be Slaughter and the Dogs or Chelsea or, <laughs> you know, Eater rather than The Clash or, 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 or The Pistols, you know, because there aren't many of those bands who uh, cracked it as big as, as they did and became iconic after with a relatively small output. I mean, how many gigs did The Pistols do before they used to yeah. come back and just do a... Yeah. A bank snatch every two years, you know. Um, <laughs> you they, probably arrived. I think you arrived eighteen months too early. That's. I think that's five right. I mean, a minute. Yeah, and also, you know, it was it was easy to put your finger up and say, "Oh, it's bondage trousers and short hair." And one, two, three, four. You know, and as Lou Reed said, two chords is good, three chords is jazz." You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, we had at least one chord too many in our songs as well. So <laughs> yeah, um, I sort of thought. Well, that's it. I'm sort of over, even though, uh, you know, the, the damned asked me to join them and then Dave joined us. And then mm -hmm. I did uh, 1978. I did a load of songs with um, TV Smith from the adverts. Uh, we were writing together. And Tim and I had been friends more or less from the first day we met. He used to come and see the doctors down in the West Country. And I always loved the adverts. Um, and still love the adverts and still love Tim as a, as a songwriter. I think he is uh, mm. got a, a unique and, and a, a enduring talent. And I think his heart and his passion uh, are um, uh, beyond reproach and beyond question. You know, someone who does 200 gigs a year with just a guitar and a, yeah. suit, a suitcase <laughs> and doing it on a train or on a bus, not driving there. Uh, and you know, keeping uh, the ethos of of authenticity, of being someone who's genuine. I've got a lot of time for that. So we wrote some songs, uh, not knowing what we were going to do. Both our bands had split, 1978, Docs had split and Adverts had split. Tim obviously went off and did his thing, which he's been doing for the rest, the rest of his life. But I just, I just had an idea that I was going to write a... Uh, 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 an album uh, that was about a fictional character in a fictional Europe in a fictional future. Uh, and a, this was a guy who wanted to play in politics. He wanted to 
uh, use techniques that he'd learned from show business and from advertising and from marketing um, in a federal Europe sometime in the future. This was 1978, I wrote this, and I thought it was maybe 1988 or 1990, where a guy could just use those techniques and manipulate people with advertising and, and, and marketing speak and by getting the banks on side and by getting the media on side. And he wants to see more or less just for a game, whether he could become president of Europe. And he does. And this is an album I wrote called The Phenomenal Rise of Richard Strange, in which, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I wonder if this could happen. It's, it's exactly what Trump and Johnson yeah. did, yeah. you know, 30 years later, but you, you, you don't get any prizes for that. But I thought, I don't want to do it with a band. I can't afford to take a band out. I want to do something different. I want to, you know, try and be a bit original. So I took a tape recorder out with a lot of backing tracks on, and I took some films and an acoustic guitar. And I toured this across the States um, for about eight weeks, different gig every night, just learning how to do it. And then when I came back to London, I thought, I don't want to play the Marquee or the 100 Club or the Vortex or any of those places. You know, it's not my con. I want to play in an art gallery, in a prison, in a hospital, in a social centre, on the street, in a, uh, a cabaret club. Or the and I had this idea of opening a cabaret club that was a mixed media club. So we, this is 1980, 81. Uh, and the punk rock thing had sort of come and gone. It was just in its decline and no one knew quite what was coming on next. But there was a whole, again, another generation of kids who'd gone to art school and who were creative. They weren't bored and negative and nihilistic. They were, you know, people who were interested in fashion, in multimedia. Video had just started, so MTV had just started. And um, I thought, I'm going to open a club that will attract these people in and that I can perform this phenomenal rise thing in. So I opened a club in Soho called Cabaret Futura and I got a band called Soft Cell to do a night there, a band called Depeche Mode did a night there, uh, a weird Anglo-Irish guy with no teeth called Shane McGowan said, I'm gonna sing Ramble songs. <laughs> You know, uh, so he did the first Pogues gig there. And a lot of these uh, alternative comedians, the Keith Allens and the uh, Alexi Sales and all that mob came and did stuff. And we had video and we had performance art and we had dance and we had poets and all that sort of stuff. And I was up and running and, and because the club was so popular, people were writing about me and writing about the album, which hadn't even come out yet. And uh, Richard Branson wanted to sign it uh, and... We had this ludicrous uh, um, courtly dance of a, a negotiation where he took my tape of the demo up to his car. Uh, and after every song, he'd come down and say, 54,000 quid for the album. I'd say, no, go back. Hated the second song, 18,000 quid for the album. You know, <laughs> so they said, I was there. And of course, in the end, it was 54,000 quid for the album. Yeah, so I did that. <laughs> Uh, and then I disgraced myself at Manchester Megastore when they opened the Manchester Megastore. They sent me up to do a lunchtime concert up there. Uh, and they laid on rather too much alcohol, thinking I was a band uh, <laughs> rather than a solo performer. And my tape recorder didn't drink at all, so I made up for the consumption. <laughs> and uh, I just remember giving out Demis Roussos albums to people um, <laughs> because Branson had said, we'll shift a lot of product. I didn't know he meant mine, you know, I just thought. Yeah, yeah you meant to sell it as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was early eighties, the, the club was up and running and, and um, well, it's and interesting that, that, getting, that album came out, yeah. Been on the curve twice, you know, because often people get the moments, maybe you could be before the curve, but you only get yeah. to do that once, but you've actually uh, hit it twice there. Well, I, I, I was lucky, but, you know, in the same way that I guess David Bowie probably hit it five times, mm. you know, space. Uh, I saw Bowie with Roy Harper when Bowie was a, a mime artist with a little acoustic mm. guitar sitting cross-legged on the floor. Then he was a sort of um, mod jazz band. Uh, then he was Space Oddity with long hair and, or, or a perm. Mm. Then he disappeared. Then he came back as the man who sold the world. Uh, in a dress, didn't work, you know, uh, and then came back again as Ziggy Stardust, you know, and I saw every one of those iterations, so I always loved Bowie. Um, 
But it wasn't until Hunky Dory stroke Ziggy Stardust that he actually cracked it. You know, mm. and that was the first time, and that was probably 10 years that he was trying there. So I mean you um, take insp inspiration from that, you know, the obviously the time scale, but also the shape shifting and the, the different versions. Yeah. That's something you you done as well. Yeah, uh, but uh, but also I was never just interested in music. The music, in a way, was the outlet, but the the input from that always came from the avant-garde, from the from the fringes. It came from you know Burroughs and, and Ginsburg or Dylan, or it came from uh, watching avant-garde theater or weird European films, Ingmar Bergman, uh, Jean-Luc Godard, Francois Truffaut, you know, and then later Fassbinder films and stuff like that. And, and and just hanging out with creative people, art school people, I suppose, was the uh, thing. So when someone came along to the club, Cabaret Futura, and said, um, do you want to be in a film? I wasn't really interested in a film, but I was interested in the notion of, of, of how the film business worked. And I met a, a, a guy, a director, and I didn't work with him, but he introduced me to an, an agent. He said, you've got a look to you, you've got a voice and you've got a way about you. You'll always work in the film business. He said, you might not be the romantic lead. <laughs> 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 but uh, okay, uh, I've played more executioners and psychos than any <laughs> other actor in the world, I think. But um, I met this agent and she said, well, what training have you had? I said, none, but um, he said, I'll always work. And she said, well, uh, I'll, I'll take you on for three months. And, I was lucky I got a commercial, TV commercial, more or less, straight away. Then I got a stupid part in a stupid film. But then I got Batman, part in Batman, the Jack Nicholson, Tim Burton. Um, and then I got uh, um, Robin Hood, uh, Prince of Thieves. And then I got Mona Lisa and I got, you know, and I was sort of up and running and doing loads of TV commercials and TV drama. Uh, and so all that was running in the background while I was still making music. And then I started doing live theater. I got a, I got a world tour doing Hamlet with a, a Russian director who I really wanted to work with because he was, he was a favorite director of mine, a guy called Yuri Lubimov. And he wanted to do an English language version of a Russian production of Hamlet that he'd done 20 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And I went along for the uh, uh, audition for that. And to my astonishment, I got, uh, uh, I got three parts. I got. Uh, the grave digger or one of the grave diggers, the player king and the ghost. And it was a world tour. We would go to Taiwan and Japan and Australia and Poland and Berlin and Scandinavia. And it was like a two year tour. And I was up and running again, you know. I'm just the luckiest man in the world, John, that, the, the truth be told. I've never trained for anything except I used to cook for homeless people and I had to do a food hygiene certificate to do that. <laughs> yeah. that is my yeah, it's a bit hard to flag that one, yeah. yeah that is my only <laughs> qualification now, you know, so. Well, they're all, they're yeah. all different fa facets of the same creative diamond in a way, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, what I say to my students is that there's two sorts of artists in the world, those who say yes and those who say no. So the ones who say no are the ones who, who are, they know what their skill set is, they know how, where they feel safe, they know how, how good they can play or guitar or saxophone or whatever, how well they can uh, do Shakespeare, but they don't want to do comedy, or how well they can do TV drama, but they don't want to go on stage. I'm like, bring it on, you know, anything. And, uh, <laughs> I, I was doing a, um, a, a lot of commercials in Scandinavia back in, the, <clears throat> back in the 80s. And there was one director I worked with a lot and he phoned me one day um, and he said, look, I'm doing something for the Swedish lottery. Uh, gave me the dates, can you do them? I said, yeah, great, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that was it. And then he's just chatting about other stuff. He said, great, and just as he's, uh, hanging up. He said, oh, you can ride a horse, can't you? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, see you next week. <laughs> never, never seen that, never been on a horse in my life. Uh, and um, uh, a, a tip to all these aspiring young actors, if you say you can ride a horse, at least have a couple of lessons before you go to <laughs> Yeah, the... <laughs> yeah, I'm quite daunting, I've sat on a horse. It's, it's, yeah, a, lot, they, it's a lot higher up in the air than you think, isn't it? A lot <laughs> higher up, yeah. So, you know, it's that thing, and the, Coming up, coming right up to date. I mean, uh, I say up to date two or three years ago. I got a call in the middle of my summer holidays in April, August somewhere saying, um, 
would you be interested in being the narrator uh, for the British premiere of Frank Zappa's opera, 200 Motels at the Royal Festival Hall? They were going to do it at the Albert Hall 30 years ago, but it got banned for bad language and uh, then Zappa wouldn't let it uh, be shown in Britain at all. Zappa was now dead, but his widow wanted it to be part of a, a year long celebration of 20th century music at the uh, Royal Festival Hall. I said, would you be the narrator? And I'd seen bits of um, uh, 200 Motels and, it, and Zappa, I'm not a huge Zappa fan, but I, I get him. I, I get why people love him. So I said, yeah, that's great. That's August, right? So yeah, lovely. So I didn't hear any more. They just gave me the dates or uh, the date or uh, the rehearsal dates and the date of the concert they gave me. So that's all linked in. Then about a week before the rehearsal start, they uh, phoned me up and said, can you sing a low B note? So I've got my guitar tuner out. And, <laughs> and I think yeah. I'm the narrator. It's going to be a gimmick, you know, it's just going to be a gimmick. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, great. The day before the rehearsal, I got the music and they said, will you sing the baritone part in the entire opera? <laughs> and I don't read, I don't read a, a, a note of music. I don't say that with any uh, pride, but it's just, a, yeah. So it's like sending me the script to Hamlet in Finnish, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a play, and I, like, I, like I could see that was music, but it might have, I didn't even know if I was hard for the right way up. Anyway, next day was the, the one day of rehearsal. Uh, and they had some great people in it. They had a jazz singer, Ian Shaw was doing it, a wonderful soprano, um, Claren McFadden was doing it. There were about eight lead singers, and uh, myself now among them. Uh, and we got in first day, had a cup of coffee, and the uh, rehearsal director said, look, we don't have much time, the show's tomorrow, let's get started. Let's just run it from the top, shall we, with a piano. So, starts off with my... Uh, um, narration ladies and gentlemen 200 motels whatever it is piano player starts ian starts singing blah 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 and i can see my first singing entry point coming up like a car crash right <laughs> and uh, sure enough here it comes it's, and it's zappa music you know it's not it's not peter sarstedt you know where do you go yeah. to lovely oh, I can get, da, 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 da. it's zappa it's like <laughs> 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 and she says have you got the right music there i said well listen i don't actually read music this was sort of sprung on me a bit what i was going to do today is just listen and i'll learn it tonight and we'll do it at the royal festival hall in front of a full house and live on radio three tomorrow <laughs> she says are you sure i said yeah it'll be fine so we did the rest of the rehearsal had lunch then went into the big rehearsal room with the 80 piece BBC concert orchestra, a 40 voice choir, eight piece jazz band, four piece rock band, and the conductor who's just phoned in from Antwerp or something. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have much time, he says, let's go straight in. And same thing, ladies and gentlemen, 200 motels, blah, blah, blah. And then again, the only difference with my first vocal entry this time is that I've got 232 pairs of eyes on me. <laughs> Has he got the right music? What is he singing there? So again, I had that embarrassment of explaining to the conductor now, the maestro with his baton in his hand. He said, like, stop, stop. Um, said, I'm going to learn it today. I'll learn it tonight on the guitar. <laughs> uh, and he said, do you want me to get one of the uh, baritones in the choir to sing it and you mime it? Certainly not. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> so we did it. And... Um, the uh, soprano was a lovely woman. She said, would you mind if I locked you into my dressing room until you sing it right twice? And that's what she did. And she taught it to me and she was wow, brilliant. Wow, that's pretty good. And, yeah. uh, and, and we did it and we brought the house down the next day, yeah. So, so it's mean, that thing of say yes. That's what I say. You know, no one ever died uh, on stage trying to play Stairway to Heaven, to my knowledge, you know. Mm. So, you know, Rock and roll is not actually that dangerous. It's not like dance where you're, you know, you're catching people or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, I've always said yes. And, and because of that, I've been lucky. I've worked with Jack Nicholson, Tim Burton. I've worked with Tom Waits and Marianne Faithful, And I've worked with Jarvis Cocker and I've worked with William Burroughs, you know. I'm just lucky um, because I'm sort of fearless. 
I guess. And and well, I think I think I've I've got a skill I've got a skill set that I can adapt to many things. Um, Robert, Robert Wilson, who directed uh, Tom Waits's The Black, Black Rider, Rider, and I, yeah. I love I love I love Tom Waits. I love The Black Rider, and William Burroughs wrote the screenplay for it, the stage play. Robert Wilson, who I love since Einstein on the Beach was going to direct it. And I met him just by chance at a party in London. I said, what are you doing here? I love your work. He said, I'm casting for Tom Waits, The Black Rider. I said, when? He said, tomorrow is the last day at the Barbican. I said, can I come? He said, yeah. Are you an actor? I said, yeah, I'm an actor and a singer and blah, blah, blah. He said, bring, bring a guitar, whatever your instrument is, and we'll just put a song on tape for Tom. So I went in and we had a chat and we, we got on well. And then he said, do you know any of Tom's songs? And I'm thinking, I know just about everything Tom Waits has ever written, but you know what? Yeah. I, haven't got, I haven't got mug written on my back uh, that I'm gonna <laughs> sing a Tom Waits song for Tom. So I sang a song that I'd written that was a sort of Tom Waits sort of song. Um, and they put it on tape and the next day he phoned me and said, uh, yeah, Tom said, great, yeah, you're in if you want it. And Marianne Faithful was playing the devil in this thing. So we went to San Francisco and uh, Los Angeles and Sydney and the Barbican. They were the only four gigs, but over over two years. Mm. It's a great it's album. And I, I, oh, I've seen, I love it, it. seen it on YouTube. It's fantastic. Ah. So, so what brought you back to, uh, to music again, your music? I mean, you said it was always in the background. Yeah. Well, what Is happened that... about, about three years ago, um, I was... Uh, I was ill and, and, and I was feeling the imminence of my mortality. I was quite ill, I was in hospital. And I was thinking, bugger, I still haven't really made the record I'd like to be remembered by. Um, among other things, I was thinking that about writing a will. Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and anyway, I started writing furiously and it was easy to write furiously because I was furious. I was furious that I was dying I was furious at Brexit. I was furious at Trump. I was furious at Johnson, you know, uh, or uh, back then it was uh, Cameron and, and Theresa May. Uh, and I was furious about the way my country was going. Uh, and I was furious about the way the world was going. And I started writing an album called Dark Times and it's about uh, my observations about uh, that world. And I wrote eight or nine songs in fairly quick succession. And I got discharged from hospital um, and started demoing them here in, 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 in this room. And I thought, I'm too close to these things now. I don't know if I think they're good just because I'm so relieved that I'm not dying as far as I know yet. So I sent them to John Leckie, a uh, record producer who produced the second Doctor's album. Funny enough, produced uh, uh, Bebop Deluxe as well. But also the went adverts. on, yeah. yeah, and the adverts, that's right. Mm. And, but he also went on and obviously did the skids, but he, he did Stone Roses, he did Muse, he did Radiohead and, and, and everything else. And John's been a mate of mine ever since I met him. He was engineer at a Roy Harper session in uh, Abbey Road. Um, I said, John, I'm sorry, I know you're really busy. Will you just have a listen to these and tell me if I'm deluding myself? And he got back the next day, he said, we've got to make this record. How much money have you got? About 15 quid. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he said, yeah, I thought so. He said, look, um, let me phone around a couple of studios. Are you prepared to go to a, um, a residential studio? I thought he was trying to get me into a home, you know, uh, a residential <laughs> studio uh, where, where we'll work 16, 17 hours a day. I said, anything, whatever it takes. And he found this studio just outside London uh, called the Dog House, where he'd worked before. He said, it's good, it's good. It's not, uh, it's not glamorous, but it works, and it'll, it'll be good for this record. So I got my two um, musicians over from Japan, uh, bass and drums, uh, Susumu and Maki Uke, who'd been playing live with me up until that point, and said, we're making a new Docs and Madness record. I found them because they were in a Docs and Madness tribute band in Japan, <laughs> right? And I was too in Japan. And I didn't have a band. And someone said, they're really good, you know, they know all your stuff, and they were. So they've been my band ever since. Right? Okay. They can't yeah. yeah, they can't believe their luck. They went from tribute band to band. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they came over. And so we started working really, really quickly. 
uh, putting down the back of tracks and I was playing all the guitars. They were playing bass and drums. Uh, and I had a couple of friends and my stepdaughter, Lily Bud, has got a band called The Glare. She's got a fantastic voice and I wanted, I wanted some really good singing on this record as well. Uh, and then something miraculous happened. Um, people heard that I was back in the studio doing a Doctors of Madness album. And the first person who phoned me was Joe Elliott from uh, Def Leppard, who'd been a Doctors of Madness fan from Year Dot, right? He said, what's this I hear about you doing a, a new Doctors album? I said, yeah, I thought I was dying, but yeah, fucking dying, man. I'm your fucking backing vocalist, he says, right? <laughs> he says, how many songs can I be on? I said, well, there's eight songs. It probably won't work on two of them, but I can't ask you to sing on six. Fucking send them, mate, he said. And he, 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 he's, he's singing on six of the songs. Then Terry Edwards, saxophone player from mm. BJ Harvey, and, and um, who was also in the band for the Tom Waits thing. I've known Terry a long time. He said, I want yeah. to be on this record as well. And so Sarah Jane Morris, I want to be on it as well. You know, and so suddenly I've got, you know, the keys to the sweet shop and all these lovely people are singing on it and playing on it and, um, and, and, and supporting it. So that came out in 2000. 19 dark times uh and got the best reviews i've ever had for a doctor's record you know so it's, it, it is the best album though which is uh, kind of makes sense that you do your career very unconventional yeah. by making your best uh, record at, at 30 years after you were going <laughs> yeah well th thanks for that it, it, that means a lot John. I think, but um i think the song's always good but in the before but the production on this is really yeah. fantastic i know john yeah. worked with you before yeah, it's got a clarity to it and a focus to it, which yeah. maybe didn't have so much in the seventies. Yeah, I think that's right. And also, I mean, God, uh, with a bit of luck, I've learned something in thirty years, you know, <laughs> about songwriting, about performing, <laughs> about you know, you don't have to go over the top to make a point, and you know, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to scream everything. Mm. Know, so. Mm. so yeah, that and then coming right up to date. Um, T.B. Smith and I rediscovered these songs that we'd done in 1978 and we'd recorded. And I listened to them. I said, I said to him, you know what? They're really not bad. We did them all on a, a Revox two-track, bouncing, bouncing tracks down as we went. And um, I gave them to my mate Adam uh, Glenn, who's a, a publisher and a, a record person. And he said, I think we can get these sounding quite good. So he mastered them. He said, look, why don't we just release these for record store day, do it just on vinyl, uh, but make a really nice package, gatefold cover, photos, lyrics, uh, sleeve notes, red vinyl, good quality and everything. So fantastic, let's do that. So he believed in it enough to do it and got Cargo involved on that. Then I said to Tim, you know what, we're gonna to have to relearn these songs. We might have even have to do a gig. He said, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so about three weeks ago, I came, uh, I went down to, to Dartmoor, where, where Tim lives, um, and he's got a little studio down there, and we just learned all those songs at once over. Uh, and he said, well, let's do a gig in the pub over the road on Saturday, you know, small pub, but let's try them out. So that's what we did, and they went down really well. And then, to bring him right up to date, we found this song that we wrote um, around 1978 as well, I guess, called Don't Panic England. Um, which the doctors recorded with Dave Vanian, but it never really came out. It was right at the fag mm -hmm. end of our life. But I said to you, you know that, that's a really good song. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's update the lyric a bit. Uh, and it's, it's bang on message. So we did that. And I said, send me um, a demo of you just singing it with the acoustic guitar and I'll put I'll put the recording together here. We'll make it into a, a fucking huge record, right? So he did that. Been putting all the drums and, you know, on big drums and keyboards and everything, right? It's all been going on. Get loads of guitars going on. Got Lily Bud in to do big choruses. Got a whole family in to do big, big sort of football terraces choruses. I played it to Martin Ware, uh, who's my boss where I teach at the moment up at Tile Yard. I said, Martin, you are 60 million record producing, uh, uh, 60 million sales record producer, Tina Turner, Terrence Trent Derby, Eurasia. Just have a listen to this. And Martin says, I don't want to muscle myself in here, but can I remix it with you in my studio? 
said, he's serious. He says, yeah. So we just done that, and it is sounding epic. And uh, I think it's coming out next week. Okay, so it's part of it. So the tour is part of this, yeah. isn't it? Or what? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So what so, can we expect? expect from the live show what's, what's going so to be the, going on? the live show is going to be uh in three elements it's going to be um myself solo tim solo and the two of us together doing all those songs from that album plus uh some uh the, the closest we have to greatest hits yeah. <laughs> 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 and after that, so what are the projects? Is it going to be another Doctor's uh, album? Or? I, I, yeah, I'd like to do a new Doctor's album. I'm doing a, I'm writing a play at the moment, um, which is terrifying. I, uh, what happened, I, I, I did some lectures in Portugal uh, to uh, an art school, um, just about general creativity uh, a couple of years ago and uh, became friends with a professor over there. He's a performance artist and a painter and an academic and so on. And he said, it'd be great if we could do something together, you and me, but not music, although he does make music, but he said, so something more performance-based. I said, yeah, I'd love to, because I really like him. And uh, he said, have you got anything? I said, well, I've got this one thing that's been banging around in my, in my head for a couple of years. It's a, a two-hander play uh, set in Spain around the death of Franco. Uh, and I know very little about it, except that its title is when you awake, you will remember nothing. And I know how it starts. And I think I know how it ends. But that hour and a half in the middle, I've got no idea. <laughs> he said, hmm, could you put the sort of mood board together? Like, it's a little bit like that and a little bit like that and a bit of that and a little quote like that. And so I did that. He took it to the Portuguese Arts Council and to our astonishment and horror They've given us money to put it on, right? <laughs> so we actually open in um, in Lisbon on the 28th of October. So I was over there last uh, for the last 10 days, rehearsing and writing with him. Uh, and it's sort of ready now. And yeah, it's just a two-hander. It's just me and him. It's got a lot of film. It's got a lot of pre-recorded sound. Uh, it's, it's, it's a drama, uh, but it's quite... Um, uh, ambiguous as to quite what it's about. Yeah. Well, now mm. I know what it's about, but it's uh, it's not um, it's not a straight story that with beginning, middle, and end. But yeah, and then we're going to do that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then we're going to do that in London in January for ten days in London, uh, and a couple more shows in Portugal in January as well. So yeah. a lot of on, lot of ongoing projects. A lot of yeah. a lot of ongoing yeah. stuff. Yeah, and uh, all very exciting it's great to be able to make stuff go out and do live stuff again and uh as has always happened with me that uh the possibility of actually meeting people is what sparks new ideas and and, and new projects you know collaborations that i never expected to i never expected to write a play for the portuguese arts council you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's what someone else does 